You can turn our Bibles again to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and at this time I would like to read verse 14. First Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. To your congregation and family and friends who are present this afternoon, uh, over the past month we've been working our way through a three-part sermon series on understanding infant baptism. And this is the third and final sermon in that short series that helps us understand the biblical basis for what we have just witnessed this afternoon. And repeatedly throughout, we've been emphasizing that while baptism is an important issue, one that we must have firm convictions about, Yes, yet as we discuss this topic, we recognize that we do so. Our disagreement is primarily with brothers and sisters in the Lord. And so this grieves our heart to see that the church of God is divided over this most important issue. And so I say that so that we come to this topic with a spirit of love for those we differ with, but also that we understand our biblical basis and develop our convictions from Scripture. And so just to summarize where we've been in this sermon series, in the first sermon we laid out our basic argument, our main argument, and that was that God has put children of believers into the church and in, into the covenant when he established the covenant with Abraham in Genesis And then God put these children in, and at no time throughout Scripture, at no time does God ever push them out or or remove them. And so we conclude that we must also recognize their place within the covenant and within the church and therefore give them the sign of inclusion, being circumcision in the Old Testament and baptism in the New In the second sermon, we were answering one of the major objections, that question, what about the new covenant? Isn't there something new, totally distinct from what God has been doing in the past? And there we we sought to show you how how the new covenant is, is not something brand new, but rather it's the final installment of this one unified covenant of grace that God has been working throughout all of Scripture. And it's in the new covenant that the promise, the promised Christ, finally comes and accomplishes all that has been promised. And he is the mediator of this covenant of grace. And so then in this final sermon, we aren't laying out the main argument, but what we want to do is supply supporting evidence. We want to, we want to give secondary reasons why we believe infant baptism is biblical and right. And so the, the guiding question for us this afternoon is this. How are children of believers viewed in the New Testament? When we step into the pages of, of the New Testament scriptures, do we find the children of believers being viewed the same as the children of pagans? That is, outside the church, outside the covenant, Or, in contrast, do we find the children of believers viewed in the same way as Old Testament children of believers? Meaning, included in the church, included in the covenant. And I believe if we examine the biblical data in a fair manner, we will see that the New Testament presents the children of believers in the same way as the children of believers of Old Testament saints. They are viewed as covenant children. And so that's our title for this afternoon. Covenant children. First, we'll see the same status. And second, the same standard. And then at the end, I want to 
make it personal and wrap up the sermon series by driving home what this all means for us. And so covenant children, first of all, the same status. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul has been writing to the church in Corinth. In this city, Corinth was notorious for being a trade center, but also a city of, of sexual immorality and, and all sorts of gross sin. It was the home of many pagan cults, and it's this city where God has established his church, and it's primarily a Gentile church. And so in this letter, Paul has been arguing for the need for holiness, a need for a separation between the church of God and this pagan city. And here we are in in chapter 7, and Paul is speaking about marriage. And really the great concern that that leads up to our text in verse 14 is, is this question. There were believers in the church who were wondering, what is, what's the status of my marriage? What should I do? I, I, was a, I was an unbeliever. I was a pagan when I got married, and so I married a fellow pagan. But now, by God's grace, I've been saved. And here I am, and I'm unequally yoked, as it were. I'm a believer, but my spouse is not. And so, and I'm, I'm called to be holy, and so should I be staying in this marriage, or should I be leaving and be setting myself free? Well, Paul's answer is no, no. Do not leave. If your unbelieving spouse is departing, is leaving you, then let them go. But you yourself are to remain. And there, this is because Scripture presents marriage as a creation ordinance. It's, it's not, marriage isn't dependent on, on whether one is a Christian or not. Of course, Christians are called to marry in the Lord, but marriage is an institution that has been given to humanity. And so we grieve when we look around and we see society degrading this good creation ordinance that God has prescribed. But Paul then uses an interesting argument for why the believing spouse shouldn't leave. And he says that in verse 13. And notice his argument. Verse 13, And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him, Reason, verse 14, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. And so trace Paul's argument with him. Notice that his starting point, his foundation, his, the thing that he assumes is the holiness of believers' children. Notice how he states that. He says, the starting point is the children of believers are holy, and we'll define what that means in a moment. But that's his foundation. And because that is true, Paul says, therefore, it's a small step to recognize that the unbelieving spouse is in some way sanctified or made holy by the believing spouse. Now, the word holy and sanctified, they share the same root word in the Greek. And so what Paul is saying is the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, and that would be unthinkable. That's that's his attitude as he's writing this. That would be absolutely unthinkable, that your children would be unclean, for they are holy. So that's the foundation of his argument, the holiness of believers' children. But that then raises the important question, what does holy mean? Well, if you were here this morning, we said that there are two basic meanings to holiness in Scripture. The one meaning is to be morally pure. We said, God, he is holy. He is morally pure. And so is Paul, as he's writing to the Corinthians, is he saying believers' children are morally pure? Is that his usage of holy? And the answer is emphatically no. Paul knows what David wrote in Psalm 51, verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. David was born to to covenant parents, to believing parents. He's the son of Jesse, and yet he's saying, 
I, I, I came into this world a sinner, morally impure. Or Paul says the same thing in Ephesians 2, verse 3. Ephesians 2, verse 3, he says, We all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. And so notice what Paul is saying. He's including himself. Paul, a covenant child, is including himself, saying, we all were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. And so Paul is not saying, in 1 Corinthians 7, that the children of believers are morally pure. That is not what he's saying. This is exactly what our form has emphasized to us. When we come to the baptism font, we are saying our children are dirty and they need washing. And so that means that when we baptize our children, it is a danger a, a, a great danger to assume that this child is morally pure, that they are regenerate. That is not what we do. We, we don't make that dangerous assumption. Remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3. And again, Nicodemus, who is he? He is a covenant child. And now he has grown up and he is a leader in that covenant community. And Jesus says to him, that covenant child You must be born again. You need a second birth. Your first birth, it had a defect. You you need a, a spiritual birth, one that is worked by God. And so we are to tell our children the same thing. You are not morally pure. You you need to be born again. You need God to do this gracious work. And so we don't assume that our children are regenerate. And yet, at the same time, we equally don't assume that they are unregenerate. Just just think of Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 1, verse 5, God comes to Jeremiah and he says, this is the Lord speaking, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And that is that word that is full of God's love. I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. That's the same word. I sanctified you and I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. And there's John the Baptist as well, seeming to be spiritually alive in the womb. And so here's the point. We don't know. We don't know the the, the spiritual status of, of our children when they are that young. We don't know their state. And so we don't make assumptions. That's not the basis for baptism. And that's not, and Paul is not meaning that our children are morally pure. So what does he mean? Well, the far more common usage of holy means to be separate or to be distinguished, to be set apart for the Lord's use. And so I mentioned this morning that, that the Sabbath was, was to be holy. It's, it's, it's an ordinary day. It's a day like any other except for the fact God has claimed it for himself. He has, he has reserved the seventh day, the Sabbath day, for himself. And now the Lord's day, it's his day. And so it's distinct because God has made it distinct. And the same is true. You go through the Old Testament, you find this repeatedly. There is, uh, in, in the temple, there is holy oil and there is holy bread, the show bread. It's ordinary bread, except for the fact God has laid claim to it and said, this is reserved for my service and for my worship. And so that's what this term holy means, to be set apart for God. And now here's the point we need to see. In the Old Testament, the covenant people were called holy. Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, Moses is speaking to the entire congregation of Israel and he says, you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, reserved for himself, a special treasure treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. And so do you hear what Moses is saying? He's saying you have been separated out of the nations, the common nations, and you've been reserved by God. You've been made holy, set apart for him. And this was true of the whole congregation in the Old Testament So when you get to Ezekiel 16, that most devastating passage of the Lord's judgment upon Israel for wandering away from him, and in Ezekiel 16, 
There is God in verse 20. And listen to the condemnation he brings against Israel. Ezekiel 16, verse 20, he says, You took your sons and your daughters, whom you bore to me, and these you sacrificed to Moloch. And now listen to God's question. Were your acts of harlotry, spiritual harlotry, a small matter that you have slain my children? They were my children, my covenant children. They were reserved for me. The whole congregation was set apart. Yes, the adults, but also the children. They are my children, God is saying. They were holy. And so that's what the word holy means. It means reserved or set apart for the Lord. But what about unclean? Because Paul also says, otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. And so he's obviously saying, They are clean. They're not unclean. They are clean. So what does that mean? And again, we have to go back to the Old Testament. This is an Old Testament word. And the classic example of of someone who was unclean in the Old Testament under the Levitical law was the leper. And there you read in Leviticus 13, verse 46, he shall be unclean all the days that he has the sore He shall be unclean. He is unclean, and he shall dwell alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. And so catch what 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 this what this means for the term unclean then. What does unclean mean? Translation, it means to be outside the camp, outside the assembly, to be to be pushed out, to be pushed away, excluded from the congregation. That's what to be unclean means. And Paul says, your children are clean. Your children are holy. And so do you see the significance of these words? Paul comes with all of this Old Testament background. And he, and he brings it together in this single verse. And he's not merely saying that the children of believers are growing up in an advantageous situation. That's what our Baptist friends want to say. They are, of course, growing up in a home where they hear the gospel. That's that's an advantage. But Paul is going further and he's saying, believers' children in the New Testament, they are to be viewed the same as children in the Old Testament. They are to be viewed in the same manner. They share the same privileged status. There's there's no diminishing. There's no change that's, that's essentially what our Baptist brothers and sisters are arguing for. They're saying, yes, in the Old Testament, God included the children in the covenant and in the community, but then when you get to the New Testament, the new covenant, God has pushed them out. And what we want to say is there is no explicit verse that tells us to, to push the children out of the church, and in fact, we find the opposite. We find words of inclusion. Your children are not unclean. They are reserved for God. They are included in the community, and for they are holy. And if we go back to the beginning of this letter, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, there verse 2, Paul is greeting the church, and he says, to the church of God, which is at Corinth. To the church of God. So, so he's writing to the church. Who is the church? And he explains that in the next verse. To those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. And that verb, sanctified, and the noun, saints, they share the same root word with holy. What we find in chapter 7. And so saints, it means literally holy ones. And so our Baptist friends, they would say, see, the church is just believers to those who are sanctified and to those who are called to be saints. But if we trace that word consistently throughout the letter, we bump into our text in chapter seven and we say, no, God has included the children of believers into that term, into that word holy. And so, yes, they are separated unto God. And we could go through more examples. There are many other examples. Just think about Jesus' own, his attitude to children in the New Testament. Uh, we often hear Mark 10 preached uh, as a baptism sermon. And our Baptist brothers and sisters, again, they go to that text and they say, Jesus there, he, he takes the children to himself 
And he blesses them. He doesn't baptize them. So, so why, how is there a connection here? And we want to say, that's the connection. He blesses them. And again, that word, it's dripping with covenantal language. What does, what does that word, it, 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 in, the, in the Old Testament, we find God saying to Aaron, to the high priest, Aaron, this is what I want you to do to the congregation. Yes, to the adults and to their children. Numbers chapter six, I want you to pronounce my blessing over them. They are my people. And we hear that blessing. Lord's day after Lord's day. The Lord bless you and keep you and so on. God is, is blessing his covenant people. That's not pronounced over the Philistines in the Old Testament or the Egyptians. It's reserved for his people. And the same is true then in the New Testament. When Jesus blesses these children, he is, he is saying they are still included. They are still included in the covenant community and the church. And so, they have that same status as Old Testament children. But second then, we want to turn from the same status to look at the same standards. And here's where we want to go to Ephesians. And again, if we go to Ephesians at the beginning of the letter, Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1 and verse 1, we find a similar greeting as we found in 1 Corinthians and there is Paul, and he, he writes, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints, to the holy ones, who are in Ephesus. And so that's similar to what we saw in 1 Corinthians. And so Paul is writing to the church, to the saints, to the holy ones. And as you proceed through the letter and you get to chapter 5, Paul begins addressing different categories that make up the saints, that make up the church. And so there, chapter 5, verse 22, he's writing to wives. And then verse 25, he's writing to husbands. And then chapter 6, verse 1, he writes to children. Children, they are included. They're being addressed. They're included in the church. They're part of the covenant community. And it's here in Ephesians 6, verse 1, that we read, Children, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, that you may live long on the earth. And so notice that Paul is holding the children of New Testament believers to the same standard as he was holding the children of Old Testament believers. Of course, Paul is here quoting from the Ten Commandments. And you know how God gave these commandments to his people uh, in Exodus chapter 20. And you know how the law begins. The law begins with, I am the Lord your God. Covenant, relationship. I am the Lord your God. I am your God. That's that key covenant language that we saw in Genesis 17 a few sermons ago. I am your God. And because I'm your covenant God, because I'm your redeeming God, Therefore, live by a specific standard. And then he lays out the Ten Commandments, how to walk with their Lord and God in love. Here's how you live before me. Here's how you relate to me. And so notice what Paul does. He takes this same instruction, this fifth commandment, given to Old Testament covenant children, and he says, now you, New Testament children, follow the same instruction you are held to the same standards. Nothing has changed here. You haven't been excluded from the demands that God has, has given to covenant children. No, the same standards are coming to you. You have the same privileges, but you also have the same responsibilities. You are included in the church, and so act like it. I am the Lord your God. And just notice how Paul has tweaked the promise attached to this command. Maybe you've never noticed that before, but verse three, there's a, there's a change. Ephesians 6, verse three, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. What does our fifth commandment say? That you may live long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. So, so there God was speaking to Israel and, and the promise of Canaan, and remember that the promise of Canaan, that land promise, who was it given to first? To Abraham. Abraham. 
the one with whom the covenant of grace was established, that he was going to get this land, and it always was picturing the spiritual land. It was picturing heaven, the new heavens, and the new earth. And so here in the new covenant, in this era of the new covenant, Paul is saying to this, to this mainly Gentile church in Ephesus, That the commands, the standards are still the same, but the promise now, it's being expanded in that new covenant way. It's it's not just Canaan, but it's the whole earth. The new heavens and the new earth are coming. Right now, God, he is is renewing and leading up to that promise. And when Abraham will have realized the spiritual essence of that promise. And so Paul is showing the continuity in the unified covenant promise of grace, and now there's the widening effects of the fulfillment of the new covenant. And finally then, verse four, and you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. And so here are parents in in the new covenant era, in the church, and they're wondering, how do we raise our children? Do we, do we raise them as if they're pagans? Do we, have to, do we have to kind of go back to the drawing board? Is there going to be new instruction for us? And Paul says, no, 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 no. No, no, no. Just raise them as God has always commanded his people to raise them. Raise them like Abraham raised his children. Abraham, in Genesis 18, verse 19, God says, Abraham, I have known Abraham. I have loved Abraham in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord and do righteousness and justice. God is saying, Abraham, raise your children in my fear. Help them to walk in my ways. Point point them constantly to me. And then Paul, here in the New Testament, he, he says God wants us to do the same thing. Raise your kids like covenant children. Raise them like like Abraham. Raise them like according to the instructions of Moses. Raise them according to the instructions of the psalmist. And so here in Ephesians 6, 4, God is commanding fathers to raise their children like covenant children. And so we have to say, if God gives our children the same privilege status And if he holds them to the same standards as Old Testament covenant children, then can't we rightly conclude that the the children of New Testament believers are still covenant children and therefore ought to receive the sign of the covenant? This is the supporting secondary evidence, and you can find that all throughout the New Testament And so, like I said, in conclusion, I want to draw the threads of this mini-sermon series together with three applications. Uh, We've spent a lot of time uh, trying to look at these broad themes of Scripture back in the Old Testament and in the New, but now let's let's make this personal. What What does this mean for us, for you, as a covenant child? What does this mean? What what is God speaking to me in my baptism? What does it mean to be a covenant child. Well, three things. Number one, our baptism is saying rest. Not rest in baptism, but rest in Christ. Rest in the Christ who's been promised. Run from the baptism font to Christ, to the one who is signified by this baptism. Rest in Christ. Baptism is a sign and a seal, and and as a sign, it's, it's meant to point you in the right direction. And I know I've given you this illustration before, but imagine, imagine you were at work and you had a, a, a terrible work accident. And there you are, and you're bleeding out, and it's, and it's bad. And so you have, to, you have no time to waste. You quickly hop in your car, and you're heading for the hospital. And you're driving down the highway. And as you get close, you see a sign. And on the sign, there's that H. And suddenly, you pull over, and you park by the H. That's not going to help you. Don't rest at the sign. Go to the one who the sign is pointing to. Go to the hospital. Go to Christ. That's where baptism is calling your attention. Run to him and rest in him. 
That's the sermon. That's the sermon that your baptism is preaching to you every single day of your life. Rest in Jesus Christ. Don't rest anywhere else. And so that's the first thing. Go to the one signified. And so then this means I don't need to wonder. I don't need to wonder, is Christ for me? Is Christ for me? Can, can I go to Christ? Is he available for me? I don't need to wonder. God has told me in the gospel, in the gospel preaching, but also in the sacrament, he has signified and authenticated it, saying, I guarantee it as a seal. He is saying, Jesus Christ is the perfect savior for you, even, yes, you, the youngest child here. He's perfect for you. So go and rest in Jesus Christ. But second, our baptism is preaching to us reserved. That's the second R word, reserved. You are reserved for God. You are holy. Not morally pure, but you are set apart. Set apart, separated. God has claimed you for himself. He has marked you out. He's placed his name upon you. The name of, of being in his family, in the, in the covenant family. The triune name is upon you. His mark is upon you. You are reserved. And so that means you have no right living for this world. You, you have no right going and, and, and serving another master. You have no right going and, and living for Satan or for yourself. No, you've been reserved for God. And so let that, let that preach in your ears, baptized child or adult. Let your baptism preach to you. You are reserved. And to be clear, of course, God is the creator of all things. Everything belongs to God. The Hindu child that is born in India, is, it, they, they belong to God in the sense that God is their creator. The atheist child that's born to the atheist parents they belong, they owe their lives to God. He is their maker, he is their creator. And yet, in a special way, God hasn't come to them, but he has come to you and I. And he says, I have reserved you for myself. You belong to me. You're separated from me. He hasn't done that because we deserve this, but he's done it because he is gracious. And so his demands, his claim is upon us. Now, if God's spirit is at work, you'll see that you cannot live up to his demands and his claims in yourself. And so what will that do? That will drive you back to Christ. You will then go back and rest in Christ. Lord, I failed again. I, I failed again. And so thank you for giving me the one whose blood washes me clean. Yes, clean, pure, Better, better than water washes away dirt. Jesus' blood washes me spotless. And not only that, the Spirit then gives you a love to live for this God. He, he, the Spirit gives you a love that you have been reserved for him. What a thought. What a thought that this most glorious God who, who rightly could have sent us to hell and condemned us, he has, he has taken us and placed his mark upon us and said, I want you to live for me. Oh, the Spirit makes us love that. Here is a good king. Here is a one worth living for. Satan, he is a cruel tyrant. Myself, I am a cruel master. But here is one who's good, who's gracious, who's lowly, who's gentle. The one that I can live for is my triune covenant God. And so the Spirit works a love in our hearts to live for him. And so rest in Christ. Do that daily. Your baptism preaches that to you daily. You're reserved for God. Your baptism preaches that to you daily. Reserved, set apart. His label is upon you, his name. But thirdly then, our baptism, it also preaches to us responsibility responsibility, where greater blessings are, where greater opportunities are, where greater privilege is, privileges are, that means there's greater responsibility. Greater responsibility. What, what a frightening thing. We should shudder to think about how we can squander 
and, and stampede on all of these means of grace that God graciously comes and gives to us. Just listen to these words of Jesus in Matthew 8, verse 11. There's Jesus. He's speaking to the believing Gentile centurion. And he says in Matthew 8, verse 11, And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit, to, sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The sons of the kingdom at this time, at this moment in history, it's the unbelieving Jewish people who were covenant children, the Pharisees who saw the Christ and who didn't think they needed the Christ. They were righteous in themselves, they thought. They were fine. We don't need the physician. We're not sick. We're not like these Gentiles. They're unclean. We're clean. We're holy. And they misunderstood what all that meant. And so they rejected the Christ who had come to them. And Jesus says, the sons of the kingdom, the sons of the kingdom, they couldn't have been any closer. They couldn't have, they couldn't have had more privileges. They couldn't have had more opportunities. They couldn't have had more uh, responsibility laid upon them. The sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. These sons and daughters of the kingdom who are refusing the king, refusing the Christ, and living in an opposition to him, thinking that his patience will continue forever, thinking that all is well if we just just approach God in our own terms. I, I don't need a savior. What's all that about? Sons of the kingdom spending eternity in hell. Think about, we have some definitions of what hell is like. We don't have the full picture, of course. It's a frightening thing. It's a frightening thing, and there seems to be a sense in which those who had greater light will experience greater condemnation. The worm will gnaw all the greater. Those whose, whose consciences they've hardened against this God, this gracious God, they will suffer the worst. Their baptism, their circumcision, it will weigh heavy upon them. And so, dear covenant child, God has come to you. The gracious, triune God, he has come to you before you could go to him. And he's saying, you are mine. And here is a savior for you who has done everything that you can't do, who has won everything so that you might receive the blessings of the covenant. But there is a responsibility that rests upon you. And so turn to him. Look to him. Cry out to him. You're not too young. Go to him now. Go to him today. Talk to your parents and say, I want to know this Jesus. I want to know this God. I want to live for him. Go to them. Ask them about what it means to be a Christian in the true sense. And so, God is here through baptism and he's saying, embrace me. Embrace me as your God and you will know the happiness of living for me. Yes, in this life, but also living with me for all eternity. And scripture speaks about heaven, but it just gives us faint details of the joy, of the pleasures that abound in God's presence when we will be with him forever Think of the vast multitude, children, sons and daughters of the kingdom, children who grew up looking, like Timothy, grew up looking to the Lord for their hope, but also Manassehs who have wandered away and who have come back at a later stage in life. And also centurions, Gentile centurions who've been brought in. Praise God for his vast grace. It is undeserved. Amen.